After this redeployment, we will keep a residual force to perform specific missions in Iraq, targeting any remnants of Al-Qaeda, protecting our service members and diplomats, and training and supporting Iraq's security forces. And yes, we will make tactical adjustments as we implement this strategy. Would you as president be willing to have a military surge in Afghanistan in order to, once and for all, eliminate the Taliban? Yes, I think that's what we need. I think we need more troops there. I think we need to do a better job of reconstruction there. I think we have to be focused on Afghanistan. Uh, it is uh, one of the reasons that I was opposed to the war in Iraq in the first place. And we're also going to have to address the situation in Pakistan so that we can get better cooperation to hunt down uh, al-Qaeda and make sure that that does not become a safe haven for them. There is also no evidence that bin Laden used the term al-Qaeda to refer to the name of a group until after September the 11th, when he realized that this was the term the Americans had given him. Do you think the American people would want to send American men and women to Saudi Arabia to defend them against Iran? Well, that, that's, I think, part of the debate that should be taking place. Obviously, we've got national uh, security interests in uh, oil supplies in the region, and as president, that's something that I would factor in. Clinton also called for an umbrella of deterrence in the Middle East, defending not only Israel, but she said uh, other countries in the region, uh, suggesting that perhaps Saudi Arabia, Jordan, other places in that region. Should the U.S. have an umbrella of deterrence to protect Arab nations? Well, it, look, it, this is presupposing something that I'm unwilling to presuppose, and that is, is that Iran's going to get nuclear weapons. My intention is to make sure they don't. There was a vote in the Senate today. Joe Lieberman, who authored the Iraq resolution, has authored another resolution, and it is essentially a fig leaf to let George Bush go to war with Iran. And I want to congratulate Biden for voting against it, Dodd for voting against it, and I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. You're not going to get another shot at this because what's happened if this war ensues, we invade and they're looking for an excuse to do it. And Obama was not even there to vote. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Uh, and finally, just training people, doctors, nurses, you know, um, teachers, cr creating a uh, human infrastructure that can sustain development so that we are not uh, simply uh, always uh, coming in, parachuting in, and providing short-term relief, but we're really building capacity on the ground. That's something that I want to invest in heavily. Attention, attention, attention. Due to the large number of people arriving, we'll experience a short delay. Please remain calm and cooperative so that we can process you into the camp faster. The Senate also released documents Tuesday confirming the U.S. military hid the locations of some prisoners from the International Committee of the Red Cross in order to cover up the torture of prisoners. Now, the Justice Department is reported to be considering a set of new guidelines that would allow investigations of Americans based strictly on a set of profiles. Now, according to the Associated Press, such probes could commence in the absence of any suspicion of wrongdoing. Now, triggers could include a person's religion, ethnicity, and also travel habits. A federal appeals court has ruled President Bush can order the indefinite jailing of civilians imprisoned in the United States. The five to four decision affects reverses last year's ruling that the administration cannot label U.S. residents enemy combatants and jail them indefinitely without charge. More than 23,000 representatives of private industry are working quietly in collaboration with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. The business leaders form a group known as InfraGuard that receives warnings of terrorist threats directly from the FBI before the public does. In return, they provide information to the government. According to one whistleblower, the FBI has given members of InfraGuard permission to shoot to kill in the event of martial law. 
In a barely noticed development last week, the Army stationed an active unit inside the United States. The Infantry Division's 1st Brigade team is back from Iraq, now training for domestic operations under the control of U.S. Army North, the Army Service component of Northern Command. The unit will serve as an on-call federal response for large-scale emergencies and disasters. It's being called the Consequence Management Response Force, CCMRF, or CSMRF for short. It's the first time an active unit has been given a dedicated assignment to U.S. NORTHCOM, which was itself formed in October 2002 to, quote, provide command and control of Department of Defense homeland defense efforts. An initial news report in the Army Times newspaper last month noted, in addition to emergency response, the force, quote, may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control. The force would have weapons stored in containers on site as well as access to tanks, but the decision to use weapons would be made at a far higher level, perhaps by Secretary of Defense. Look at what it's trained for. This is the this is the third infantry first brigade combat unit that has spent three of the last five years in Iraq in counterinsurgency. It's a war fighting unit. It was one of the first units to Baghdad. It was involved in the Battle of Fallujah and you know that's what they've been trained to do and now they're bringing that training here on top of that one of the commanders of this unit was boasting in the Army Times about this new package of non-lethal weapons that has been designed uh, and this unit itself is going to be able to to use according to that The Silk Road, or Rhodes, Die Seidenstraße, is a term coined by the 19th century German explorer Ferdinand von Richthofen to describe the network of ancient overland trade routes that once stretched from East Asia across Central and South Asia to the Middle East and Europe. From the 2nd century BCE until the 14th century CE, this greater Silk Road was a conduit for travel, conquest, trade, and cultural exchange linking Roman, Byzantine, Arab, Persian, Mongol, Mughal, and Chinese empires. The transmission of beliefs, techniques, material goods, and people, along what later came to be called the Silk Road, preceded by centuries the globalization we are witnessing today. Globalization is here to stay, and this world will always be more competitive. The American empire has always been a bipartisan project. Democrats and Republicans have taken turns extending it, extolling it, justifying it. The rhetoric, often persuasive on first hearing, soon becomes overwhelmed by horrors that can no longer be concealed. The bloody corpses of Iraq, the torn limbs of American GIs, the millions of families driven from their homes in the Middle East and in the Mississippi Delta. Have not the justifications for empire so embedded in our culture and assaulting our good sense that war is necessary for security, that expansion is fundamental to civilization, begun to lose their hold on our minds? Have we not reached a point in history where we are ready to embrace a new way of living in the world, expanding not our military power, but our humanity. 